I have driven Delhi, Bangalore at least three times. Which car is it? Safari. Okay. So, that's the three times that I have driven the car. Never take a halt. And uh, 36 hours in a single stretch uh, with 30 minutes of a sleep and some piece meals in between. <laughs> but that's a, that's a kind of a passion that drives me. Yes, they are sleeping most of the time. So I'll try to bring in the family security as well, kind of a context. Thank you, thank you so much, Shino. And welcome everyone. Uh, it's unlike Bangalore weather today, but uh, that's perfectly fine. So why we are here today is to understand why cyber security is important and how we together can fight the cyber criminals. That's the underlying message, right? Now, I don't say, but this is something which is by the FBI director. He says there are only two types of organizations, one who are already hacked and the one who are ready to be hacked, right? Which essentially means that there is nobody in this world as an organization who is foolproof, not even a PwC, to be honest, right? The moment we get onto a digital footprint, that's where we expose ourselves to the larger world of the cyber criminals. Now, if you take a step back and rather than looking at the organization, if you look at our home, we have got the Wi-Fi routers, we have got the smart TVs, Apple TVs, Chromecast, Amazon Fire, you know, all those devices we have at home, right? How many of us usually go and change the configurations of those devices? I would say probably 50% or less than that, right? We use smart watches nowadays, right? But how many of us really go into the settings and change and see what is the password of it? What is the OS on which it's running? Probably very less of us, right? What that usually translates into, we are depending and we are assuming that whatever devices or whatever setups that we are doing, it's actually a foolproof, right? That's our trust on the brands that we purchase. That's actually wrong, right? Honeywell got breached in, you know, sometimes uh, uh, probably a month or a back, right? Schneider has uh, taken a cyber attack, right? Verizon in the US have taken a breach. Deloitte is a consulting firm. They have seen a compromise happening at their location as well. So none of the organizations are safe. And we are buying these services and the products from these organizations only. So it's, you know, false for us to believe that we are living in a secure world. We are not. Now, the moment we start our day, we interact with at least 10, 12 technologies in terms of our cars, in terms of our smartwatches, smartphones, laptops, Fitbits, you know. So we interact with a lot of technologies the moment we start our day and the moment we reach to the office. And that's where the attackers try to target us as an individual. They try to target those organizations which has a larger customer base or, the, or a larger customer aggregation, so as to say. So they target those companies. Why? Because there's a volume in it. Now, if you talk about the volume, this is one of the you know, live data feed that we have taken from So I'll just try to get it done.
Right, so this is one of the data feed that we have taken from an organization called NORS. So this is one of the data feeds, sorry for that, uh, that we have taken from the NORS. Now what is NORS? NORS is nothing but they, it's one of an organization who has their sensors deployed across the networks in the world, across the networks, under sea cables, from Verizon, from at and they have got their sensors installed. And according to them, every day, there are 70 lakhs records across the globe which are being compromised. Right? Now these 70 lakh records uh, could be ours as well. Right? We probably fall into that 70 lakh category as well from one organization or to the other. It may happen that Microsoft is getting breached or Google get, uh, is Google's of the world are getting breached. And since we are on the Android or the mobile of the Windows platform, we are also contributing to those 70 lakh records. So this is a world that we live in. Now, if we really see why these attacks happen? It primarily happens because of five people, right? There are insider threats. So I work in an organization, I have uh, access to the application, I have access to their IT systems, I have access to the network. I'm a privileged user of that organization. The damage that I can cause by misusing my credentials can be devastating to an organization, right? So I am an insider threat to any organization that I work with. It could be my client as well, right? So that's an insider threat. Nation states typically fight for the political reasons, right? And that's where China, Russia, India, Japan, Pakistan, US, they all fight with each other. And that's where we say it's a, it's a fight between the cyber armies these days, right? So every country has a cyber army in one shape or the other, right? And it's a cyber war which is happening. The motive is pretty simple. Gain the political influence over the other country. That's a motive. But what it can lead to is a impact on the national security, right? That's what can happen with the nation states fighting with each other. With the hacktivism, the motive is a business change. I want this organization to change, right? I want this organization to work differently. And that's where it caused a lot of brand reputation impact on the organizations which faces these effects. Organized crime, uh, it's primarily for the financial gains. I want to earn money. I want to put the hacked or a compromised records onto the public network so that I can work with the organization to get more, more money for myself. So it's a financial crime. The impact is a customer confidence. If I'm an Airtel user, the Airtel data records are breached, my confidence on the Airtel security will go down. Right? As simple as that. We transact a lot using the Paytm nowadays. What if tomorrow there's a news which comes into the market which says that the Paytm is breached? The data that Paytm stores is onto the public network. That's where we'll start to fear whether I'll, I should go for the Paytm as an account holder or not. Cyber terrorism, again, it's a professional uh, line of business. It's primarily to do with the revenge uh, kind of a motive and damage that it can cause is the competitive advantage being transferred to the competition, right? So these are the threat actors that we have seen over the years who targets the organizations, targets the individual, and they try to be benefited out of it. How they do it? Pretty simple. Go to the Tor network, install a Tor browser onto your laptops, mobile phones nowadays, connect to a VPN, browse through it, you'll get ready-made tools, pay to get those tools, get your work done. Not interested in running the tools? No worry, rent a hacker. Right? It's as simple as that. And the hacker will only cost you $20. Right? So it's as cheap as that. It's at a dirt cheap price. Depends on what you want a hacker to do. You want a hacker to hack Google? Probably 2 million or something. 
you want a credit card number to be used for a transaction, eight dollars. Right? It's dirt cheap. Now, because of an organizational structure, they operate globally. Right? Uh, when they operate globally, they have customer base across the nations. When they have a customer base across the nations, it becomes difficult for them to manage the regulators. Because regulators are the one who will govern what to do, what not to do in that law of the land. That's where if they don't follow, they are facing some serious revenue penalties and they can be jailed as well. Right? Under a GDPR regime in the EU region, they the organization can be penalized if they don't follow a data privacy laws of the European Union, they can be penalized up to 4% of the global revenue, leave aside the profits, right? So for example, HCL is India based organization, they are having an operation let's say in somewhere in the European Union, if they fail to comply there, then the overall HCL revenue will be at a stake, 4% of it at least. Right. Same goes for the Indian, any other Indian based organization, Infosys, Repro, PwC, Deloitte, any other organization, you name it. So the penalties are very, very big. In Netherlands, you can lose up to 10% of the yearly revenue. That's what the penalty is. India is still, you know, catching up. They have released a data protection bill, a draft of it, kind of a, you know, similar lines with what the GDPR says. Right. So still India is catching up in terms of the regulations, but then I think, I think most of the organizations today are global, right? So most of these regimes will fall under the, under the carpet for them. Now it's interesting to see, you know, this is what can happen, right? Now let's look at what already has happened. SBI access bank wallet apps have to siphon off the rows. This news was there about a couple of years back in the paper. Bangladesh Bank, 81 million east of the dollars. I was there in Bangladesh when this happened. Indian card processor, Electra Card, Pune based organization, 45 million dollar east. I was one of the investigators for this particular case. Now, if you look at the Bangladesh Bank, SBI Access Bank, you know, Electra card breach, all of them, these things could have been avoided very easily. It was not a magical sword that somebody had to come and, you know, say, Foof, and, you know, the organizations are safe. No, they did not patch their systems. Patches which were released in 1999 were not implemented till 2013. And still people are running on those, on those systems. I'll take a classic example of any oil and gas industry. These industry, the factories that they have, they are still running on Windows XP. In our home, we don't run Windows XP anymore, right? Now, Windows XP is one such operating system which is very beautiful, very robust, very scalable. But then, unfortunately, the Microsoft doesn't provide patch to it, right? Now, if there is no patch to a serious security vulnerability, it's like we are living with a cancer without treating it, right? Now, the moment we say the operating system is end of life and end of support by the vendor or by the product owner, that essentially means that we are getting into a gray zone. We need to be sure that there is a support of the patches of the security issues that may come up at a later point in time that we may feel that these needs to be plugged in. And if you don't get that support, we are basically running on the assumptions. We are truly believing that I am secure. I have my photo build. I have my policies, procedures, people, technologies to, to protect me. That's a false hope. We have already seen an insider threat, right? That's a false hope that we live in. Anyways, let's see what happens to the Oops, voice.
so this is i'll just play, play this video but this is basically from the uh, uh, the facebook breach that happened it was not a breach of a facebook facebook is secure till date this is what we believe this is what we assume right but then is my data safe with facebook Probably no, because this is the instance that we have seen in the world. Cambridge Analytica was one of the organizations. Uh, in fact, that was not an organization who was dealing with the Facebook directly. One somebody individual go onto the Facebook, creates a bot, downloads the data, data and analytics, sells it off to the other people, right? And we believe Facebook is hacked. No, there was a breach of trust between one entity and the other right the mistake that facebook did is once they were made aware of the situation they probably did not took the appropriate measures to make sure that the information which is downloaded is safe and probably that's the only mistake that caused them a lot of you know public disgrace so I'll try to play the video again. We didn't take a broad enough view of our responsibility, and that was a big mistake. And it was my mistake, and I'm sorry. I started Facebook, I run it, and I'm responsible for what happens here. There are people in Russia whose job it is is to try to exploit our systems and other internet systems and other systems as well. So this is an arms race. I mean, they're going to keep on getting better at this, and we need to invest in keeping on getting better at this too. Are seven million users? Do you consider them victims? Yes, I mean, they, they did not want their information to be sold to Cambridge Analytica by a developer. In retrospect, I think we clearly view it as a mistake that we didn't inform people. I think the internet is so important in people's lives and it's getting more important. Yep. The expectations on internet companies and technology companies overall are growing. And I think the real question is, what is the right framework for this, not should there be one? So a CEO of a Facebook getting testified in front of a Congress, right? This is exactly what happened with Electra Card as well. I have seen a CEO of an Electra Card being testified in front of a RBI governor. And tough questions being asked there right do we want to be in that situation probably not right but are we the ceos probably not, right but then do we want our ceos or our leaders to be in that particular situation as well probably not right what happens to target there there was no ceo who you know who was testified or something the target had a, a you know center in bangalore they were working with the with the parent organization in the us there was a breach which was identified in bangalore by the sock people they had a wonderful sock it was identified notified to the us uh, you know bosses probably they were late in responding to the situation that caused the breach and the, the data went public the cio and the c ISO lost their job, right? That can happen to anybody, right? It's a it's a very recent example. I would say about three four years back only that happened, right? And the breaches are happening on a daily basis. While we speak, there is some organization who's already facing a challenge. It's just that it's it's like a UP crime come hai. crime dikta nahi hai. crime is there. Right? It's simply that it's not getting reported. Right, so that's exactly the same case in the cyber world as well. The breaches are happening, it's just that it's not coming out pretty well, or it's not being made public that the organizations are breached. Sony Pictures got hacked, right, a couple of times. Sony Network, uh, then their PSN, right, it got hacked as well. So they, ha they know what the breach means to them. Anyways, uh, let's look at the you know, some of the well-known organizations who got hacked uh, is just that a data from June 2017 to uh, June 2018 data. Anthem, Verizon, Spambot, Equifax, Yahoo, Uber, 
some geo networks, Aetna, FedEx, Under Armour, SunTrust, Nuance, OneRail. It's just a matter of when. It's not a matter of if. Right? Every organization is under a threat. Right? All of these organizations are very, very big, very reputed organizations. But they fail somewhere to take a precautionary step in order to ensure the customer trust or the stakeholder trust in them. And that's where they spend a lot of money in rebuilding that customer trust back again. What can happen? Obviously, business disruptions can happen. Cyber insurance premiums go up. Damage to the brand happens, regulatory sanctions, customer fraud, hedge roll, that's the target that we discussed, customer redress, class action lawsuit, and the competitive disadvantage. All of that can happen. When Bangladesh Bank breach happened, <clears throat> they involved FireEye or Mandy nowadays to do an investigation for them. Like what happened wrong with them. They tried to you know, onboard those people. They started off with the investigation. The investigation rate was $470 per hour. That's an hourly rate. Right? After some weeks and months of investigation, they started believing that the money that they are spending on the investigation is probably as good as the amount that they have compromised. Right? And then they requested Mandian, we need not to do with the investigation now. Let's stop it. <clears throat> and they stopped the investigation in between. Then the local authorities took over and then they supported Bangladesh Bank to investigate the case. I was with Verizon before joining PwC. We used to charge $464 an hour. Quite close to Mandian. Right? When we did an investigation for an Electra card, that was in some crores for a month, right? And uh, the penalties that they have uh, faced was about 25 CR, including the uh, customer redressal in terms of the communications that they have to send back again, in terms of a <clears throat> amount that they have to pay to the card printing vendor again to print the new cards for the uh, you know consumers who were compromised. So the look at the amount that they have put in to come back up. There were few agreements which got cancelled with the Electra card and they were really pushing it hard to win that customer confidence back. Otherwise, it would have been a shut shop by now. Right? There's a lot of efforts which goes behind the scenes, doesn't come out. The moment anybody knows it's a breached organization, every consulting organization will start looking at it as a customer. Right? Why? Because they know people will pay for it now this is the time they need a doctor right and everybody believe we are the specialist right that's that's the you know beauty of the business but then at the same time i truly believe that the job of a consultant is not to rip the customer apart in terms of a long checkbooks but uh, you know truly help them in knowing what they need they probably you know get themselves treated with a 2 rupee medicine rather than spending 2000 rupee on, on the fever. Anyways, so these are some of the direct costs, indirect costs and the intangible costs which are associated with any breach that can happen to any organization. Now that we have been threatened enough, I believe, let's look at how we can improve the stuff. There are very simple six stages that we need to do. Number one, Create a cyber aware culture. We'll delve more into it. But what it translates into, be more aware what is happening around you. Keep your eyes, ears, nose, brain, everything open. Right? A breach can come in in any shape and any form. Has anybody seen a movie on a Netflix, Snowden? No? So how Snowden took the information out and that went public is in a small micro SD card. Now, he was working in one of, this is what was shown in the movie. Now, he was working in a very, very controlled, airtight, you know, a lot of physical controls, logical access control environment. Nobody was allowed to take in or out any uh, storage device. 
So the moment somebody enters into the facility, there is a very deep frisking which used to happen of the individuals, even if you are an employee. So what this guy did, he used to play that cubic, Rubik's Cube and he just, you know, customized one of the cells of a Rubik's Cube to hide the micro SD card. The moment he was entering into the scanner zone, he threw that Rubik's Cube to the physical security guard and asked him to solve it. The guard was playing with it and he crossed the zone and then he asked the Rubik's cube back. He took that back and went inside. Same trick on the way back. Right? What this, what this translates into is the guard who is standing there is believing his systems to be more secure than himself. Right? And this guy made use of it. I did one exercise uh, for one of the banks in Bombay private sector bank, very big uh, bank in uh, the BKC zone. So we did a kind of a red team assessment, not exactly a red team, but kind of a physical security assessment I can say for them. So we were a group of two people, we were tasked to breach their physical security to the extent possible. And the extent was, we managed to enter into their DR data center, took some network pictures, come out without anybody knowing that we are not from that bank, without the authorization in place, bypassing the dogs as well, which was a difficult part. But yes, how we did it? We impersonated and we made the security guards believe that we are from the bank and it's a surprise audit which is happening. That's the only task that we did. One location. Second location, we went inside with the DSLR cameras, took some snapshots, some pictures of the people saying that we are from the internal audit team. Is your PC working fine? No, absolutely not. This system is a shit piece. I don't believe, you know, you guys are giving me this laptop to work. Let me just see to it. Let me attach my USB to it. That was the only task that I did. The moment I attached my USB, there was a malware, kind of a malware, not exactly a malware, but a small script which got auto installed in that system, giving me access from outside their network, a direct access to their system. Right? And then we simply asked them, can you fill up a small survey for us on a phishing site? And they were, what will you do with this survey? Nothing. It will help us improve you, issue a new laptop with a higher configuration. Oh, seriously, I will do that for sure. Okay, let me fill up that, you know, questionnaire and that uh, survey for you. They did it. What we got? Their authentication username and the password of the Active Directory. Because the phishing site asked them to enter that. It was nowhere integrated with their Active Directory. It was just a screen. Right? You enter username, password. Even if you enter wrong one and click the submit button, it will al always give you the access to fill in the survey. But they had to enter the right username and the password. That's what they believe. Without knowing that the URL is different. Right? So that's where we, I truly believe, and it's a you know common thing as well, that people are the weakest link in the entire security chain. I believe they are the weakest link as well as the strongest link in the entire value chain of the security. So we need to improve the security, cyber awareness, culture for sure. Second, know your current state. This is really very important. Leave aside the organization. If I have to grow, I have to assess myself whether I am doing right steps or not. Whether I am driving into a right lane or I am driving into a wrong lane. If I am into a fast lane, I can go 120. If I am driving into a rickshawala lane, I can probably go up to 10, 20 miles per hour or KP, you know, kilometers per hour. So that's what it means. Know what you want to do. Know your current existing state. Go for an annual health checkup so that you can take accordingly the medicines. You can take the treatment accordingly. Similarly, for the organizations, know your current state. Know what information, what data you are capturing and storing in which place. Right? Have that information. That's very insightful. Engage with the experts and build a plan. This is not for the business, but this is for a purpose. I tried, uh, you know, doing a business sometime back when I was young. And I believe that I can do everything. I was a developer. I, I knew system administration activity. I was a database developer as well as in a 
administrator. I used to manage clusters on the Sun Solaris. So I was on the heaven. I could do anything. HTML coding, you do, you know, you ask me to assemble the PC or laptop, I would be able to do that. And I used to believe I can do everything on my own. Yes, I can. But then does it allow me to focus on what I can do better? No. My priority is to grow the business. Right? Let me focus on growing the business. The moment I get, get into the operations, I am getting into a troublesome zone. I will tell you one story, not related to security though. I was a system administrator, system administrator working with a small web hosting organization in Janakpuri in Delhi. And uh, three, four months of a job, my MD called me up and he said, I am giving you a higher position to manage the data center. So I said, oh, I don't know what you have seen in me, but thank you so much. And then he said, okay, but you have to sit outside of the data center room rather than sitting inside the data center room. I asked him, are you punishing me? He said, why? I love my friends being there, right? I could spend much better time with them. I see them struggling with some of the commands, some of the configurations. I can help them in a real time. I think that's my view. I can be more beneficial there. And he only told me one thing, be a part of a problem, uh, be a part of a solution, not a problem. That time I thought it's a gyan. I thought, okay, he has to say something, so he's convincing me. I'll get convinced he's MD, I'm still an administrator. So I said, okay, whatever you say. But now after 14 years of my work experience, I believe that's a very right thought. That's a very valid thought. Be a part of a solution rather than a problem. How many of you are married? Almost all of, all of you. How many of you have a fight at home? Right? Now, how many of you believe that you are fighting for a cause, for a right cause? Or oh, you believe, okay. So I went into a similar kind of a discussion with my wife a week back. And I believe that I am fighting for something which I really don't care about. Right? He was asking me to put some stuff into, into some stack. I don't care about it. Right? And you know, the moment I, I'll go back home, my jacket would be somewhere, my shoe would be somewhere else. And she is very organized kind of a personality. And, and we were fighting for it. And then I said, you know what, you should keep a maid. And she said, why? I said, focus on good things. Focus your energy on something which is fruitful for you. Focus on your job. Don't focus on organizing this stuff. Get yourself a maid and live happily. But then she thought that I'm still giving her a gyan, right? The fight is still on, but I'm still trying to convince her. But I'm a very strong believer that, you know, we should put our energies into the areas where we believe that could be a beneficial to us, right? As an individual or as an organization both. Business process re-engineering. That's very important. The moment we identified, we determined that there is a issue. We have to work on that issue. Most of the times, the issue is the, on the way that we are structured, even at it, even at our home. I'm very unstructured, right? That's exactly the problem with the organizations as well. We believe the process that has been laid down is working absolutely fine without any flaw, without any issue, without any jerks. No, there might be chances to improve on those procedures, the procedures or the processes. So let's rethink. Right, and where it comes all from the stage two and the three. If you know your current state and you know your goals, you can very well organize yourself, you can very well structure and re engineer your business processes to help you reap more benefits. Fifth, adopt the industry standards that we are very bad at. We, as a human being, we don't learn from our mistakes. Or rather, to put it in other words, we don't learn from others' mistakes. Right? If I see somebody crashing a car on a road, I would say, oh shit, bad driver. I would not say that, you know, it can happen to me as well. Right? So we will say, ignore bad driver crashed. I will not crash. 
I have not learned from somebody else's mistake. Breaches are happening on daily basis. We have seen that, right? But are we learning from the mistakes? No. I am going to a job 9 to 6, perfectly fine running, no issues at all, bosses are happy, working at home is perfectly running smooth, fine. But then, am I worried about it? Probably not. There are people who take initiatives, which is very good, to come up with something of, you know, of innovation and put that innovation back to the process. But then, how many of the industry leaders or how many of the organizations as a whole are ready to take on those initiatives? Very less. Otherwise, we would not, we would not have faced so many breaches in the history and to, even today as well. So it's very important that we learn from others. NIST is one such organization who do a lot of research in this particular space. They come out with you know, very good special publications and we don't download and read it. The, why, why we read it? When our CIOs or CISOs says, I have to implement NIST 600-53, please go and read it. That's when we'll go and read about it. And then also we'll only pick up those points and we'll try to map it to our process and see you know the minimalistic work that I have to do. Probably that's not the right way to do. Probably we can see it in a more holistic fashion and see how we can adopt those industry standards to the best of our organization. So adopt the industry standards. And fifth or sixth is to build the robust recovery mechanisms. Security is not the business. Business is there, that's why security is there. Right? So focus on building the robust mechanisms of the recovery for the business. Now, while we get into each of it, create a cyber aware culture. Always remember, you are the weakest and the strongest part of the chain. Right? The entire security is as strong as you are. If you are focusing and managing your basics appropriately, you will not be breached, even at home. I live in a 13 tower, you know, 13 floor building tower. When I scan the wireless network, I see many of them are running on a password 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. This laptop doesn't have a password at all, right, with the administrative privileges connected onto the Reva University's network. <laughs> right so you know this these are the small things we always go for a dlp siem all those expensive technologies we will implement and we believe start believing that we are now secure that's a false hope many organizations will implement dlp in a learning mode siem default rule sets Anybody who is looking at it, a consultant or a SOC engineer with two years of experience, right? We have implemented a crore rupee of technology, given it in the hands of two, three, four years of experience guy, and we believe that we are secure, right? Anyways, so let's move forward. So think before you act. The moment you get an email into your mailbox, think twice, thrice, multiple times before opening it. Probably on an alternate day basis, I get a phishing email on my Hotmail account. Now Hotmail also knows that this is a phishing email because of the learning pattern. The moment I get an email, I used to mark it as a spam, 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 spam. After 20, 25 iterations, Microsoft now understands that if this email is coming to this individual, it's a spam. Automatically it goes to my spam box. Right? So think before you act on anything. It may take you a 10 seconds to think at, but then it's worth it. Develop your growth blueprint. Now, this is where I strongly believe that being into a cyber business, we should all invest as an individual or as an organization. And that's where I believe, you know, organizations like Reva University or any other such institutions can be very, very handy. I have about, what, 16 certifications with me. 
I don't know what I, I'll do with those certifications. Truly, I don't know. MCSC, CCNA, RHC, uh, CDCP, PCI, you know, uh, CISA, CISM, you name it, probably I'll have it in my kitty. Right? Do I use it? No. But why, do, why should I do that? Because it gives me a perspective. It gives me a chance to think about it. At least for five days when I'm sitting into a classroom session, it builds that perspective for me in those five days how to look at the security. I'll again, tell you one very uh, you know personalized example. My wife was not working when, or rather she was working in Bangalore. She was Bangalore based. I was based at a Gurgaon. We got married through one of the matrimony portal. She moved to Gurgaon and then she quit the job. And I was a sole earning person in the family. I insisted and forced my wife to get a new job, even if it is for a 15,000 rupee. The reason was I am building a BCP for my life. As simple. Passion is driving. And it sometimes gets into a rash driving as well. Right? So I don't want to be into a situation where I am worried about my family after my life, right? And that's where I ask my wife to pursue a career into something so that she earns if I'm not there. That's building the business resiliency, as good as that. If the business controls are not there in a data center, at least we have a DR to support the business. Business cannot die. A business is as good as a human being. Right now, that's where the blueprint of your personal growth comes in very handy. It gives you a sharp jump. It gives you a perspective to look at different things, and it gives you a perspective to adopt and tailor yourself to the situation. Right. So invest in it. Second, know your current state, data, and the priorities. We discussed. If I do not know that I am living with a, let's say, a, a kidney failure, I'll keep on drinking the alcohol, beer on beer, beer on beer, beer on beer, and one day I'll die. So know, at least know your body and then you can drink accordingly. There is a rule that you can drink 60 ml on a road, drink 60 ml and drive. Right? But that's only between us. Don't drink and drive. <laughs> But then uh, know your know yourself very well, uh, know your organization structure very well, know your business processes, know what data you are capturing and storing in where. It's a very sad story for the banks, specifically a small sector banks in India. They have CBS or the you know kind of a banking system that they have. They have those core banking systems available with them, but then. The data still lies in the Excel files, clear text. The passwords are still onto the uh, notepad based file with the file name as password.txt. Right? That's irony. But that's okay. Do an e discovery for it. Know what is your current state. Where are the gaps that you need to fix? What is the data you are storing where? So that you can improve. You can build a roadmap to improve upon. And finally, ask a question to yourself as a business owner. Do you really need this information to be there with you? Probably we are collecting a lot of information than we think. If I am authenticating against an Aadhaar based transaction, do I need to store Aadhaar number? No. I simply need an authentication code whether the transaction was authorized or not, or whether the Aadhaar was authenticated or not. If the Aadhaar is authenticated, I just have to store that transaction number and the status that I have received from the UIDAI. But many people may feel, tomorrow if, what if I get a, a information that, you know, if, if I have to produce this information, tomorrow probably I will use this information and that tomorrow never comes. Right? I was being, again, you know, just digressing from the topic a little bit. Uh, there is a new movie which has come out, it's three. Right? And somebody was telling me it's based on a true facts, true story of Bangalore. 
wherein there was a you know ghost or a lady atma who used to come knock at the door somebody used to open the door and the person used to die now what people in that area did they in kannada or some language they put a notice board outside their home kalana so the ghost used to come knock at the door read the notice and go back knock at the door go back right it's it's about the same thing you don't know whether you need this information or not you will always think tomorrow will come i may need this information tomorrow i may need this information tomorrow and that tomorrow never comes right i have personally about 200 cd drives i don't know what data is in there right i have so many softwares downloaded i don't know what i'll do with those softwares and when because software version gets on changing every day the moment new microsoft of, of operating system will be there in the market i'll try to get a new copy of it why everything is there keep it in the cloud you know be go hand in hand with the generation don't clutter your uh, storage devices with it engage the experts and build the plan determine the internal capacities and capabilities that's very important that's where you you will know how many people in my organization can help me achieve this particular target or the goal that i have set from a cyber security standpoint do i need a 10 member team to support my large operations do i need a 100 member team or do i need a 1000 member team that's a question that you have to ask with the business at the same time you should also think what are the capabilities do i need in those x number of people do i need cissps in my team do i need a uh, phds in my team or do i need probably a, a mid career level individual good in security to get support from the external third parties to run the show am i investing too much into building the in house capa- capacities and capabilities or is it something that i can out- outsource and you know run the show without it that's where define your outsourcing strategy as well is it in source outsource or co source do you want to build everything inside everything outside or you want to work jointly together with the experts focus on the business growth growth that we already discussed uh from my experiences i can vouch for it it is not worth it doing everything yourself do a data flow assessment in terms of the business process reengineering know how the data is being transacted being is being stored processed transmitted communicated across the business process from one department to the other department within the organization that will help you in determining what are the areas that you need to focus in order to protect that data or that information and that will also give you an insight whether the department which is receiving that information do they really need it or not so do this data flow assessment reduce the loose data footprint because the moment you will reduce the data footprint outside the application zone you are actually reducing the area where you have to put the control the moment you reduce the area to put the control you can build a better security architecture within the organization redesign the way of working again focus on architecting your applications architecting your network layering your network and your communication channels and specifically your access control mechanisms so redesign it adopt the industry standards you talked about uh, custom tailor the controls pick up the standard do a risk assessment or the gap assessment come out with the list of controls that you need to implement truly you need to implement you you can have a list of controls which are must have you can have a controls list which is good to have and probably something which you think are good to have right and then effectively implement the short listed need to have controls build the robust recovery mechanisms to build the resiliency in the entire ecosystem of the business always remember 
securities for the business and not otherwise so invest rationally don't over invest don't over invest in technology don't over invest in building the different facilities for the security do not do that because the moment you do that the cfo will come to you and ask for the return on investment on whatever investment that you have taken and then that will be that will become a problem because that is something which is not tangible security is not tangible the only way to measure the success of a security control is to remove it right remove the security controls for a week and then you will know what is the value of a security control but unfortunately cfo doesn't understand it so define the phased approach uh, take baby steps for implementing the controls mature those controls and then move forward don't try to run in the first space invest in building the resiliency in terms of people process and technology because all of it does matter now this is all a high level gyan consulting now let's come down low hanging fruits network and security controls change management malware management data management authentication controls and finally the monitoring the environment in your organization how many of you believe you score 10 out of 10 on malware management which includes the patching as well how many of you believe that you are good absolutely 10 on 10 on change management authentication pick up any domain right that's the cause of a worry exactly the cause of a worry we are working with the uh, one of the largest oil and gas sector giant they have built a very robust data center architecture where they have a data center inside data the data center they have built another data center which is all fortified different different levels of firewalls change approval authentication multi factor authentication etc etc within that small cage data center there are consumers or different line of businesses who owns again small set of data centers right so do you believe it's a good architecture in theory yes unfortunately everything is on a same vlan right so people who understand the networks if you put everything on a same vlan if i don't put a routing in between or if i don't restrict a routing in between it's virtually i am putting everything open they have firewalls they have uh, vendors they have suppliers they have x number of people supporting it but all on a same vlan right but that's okay <coughs> if everything is on the same vlan we believe that the other mechanisms would be great right for example malware management every month we get a exception request saying that i cannot install a patch which was released couple of months back because i cannot take the business down and that exception is for 6 months which essentially translates into not installing a patch for 9 months right microsoft release patches on the tuesdays that's their favorite day right they come up with the new set of patches on the tuesdays to help the organizations be more secure we do not implement it that's our problem data management uh when you say data management it truly goes back to the area where we have to determine what the data is now when we go to the clients of ours and when we speak about the data management to them yes i know my data what do you want to know so when you do a car transaction uh, do you store this data no i don't do it fair enough let's go to the database administrator administrator can you dump a table of our cards to the uh, screen yes everything is there and then we'll go back to the gentleman you said it's not there that's what my system administrator told me we are not storing it the system administrator cannot tell you you have to go to the business to understand it and the business guy cannot tell you whether you know it's protected or not he will say i need this information simple period right 
So data management goes back to the theory that we need to understand what data we are collecting, why we need that information, till what time do we need that information. What is the maximum age of a credit card? Five years. So if I am transacting on let's say make my trip and my card is expiring let's say on uh, October 23rd or whatever in this year. Should they store my card number? Probably not because that's what my expiry date says when I do a transaction. But they can store it and eventually they will realize oh this card is expired but that's okay it's just eating up my 1 KB of data space let it be there. Probably I'll need it tomorrow. Right. So let's look at this, but the most important is we need to continuously test our environment and put the pressure on the environment to come out with the you know flying colors, not the red colors but the green colors. Right? Red colors are usually depict danger. So network and system controls, putting it very simple, these are eleven things that we need we should do in the network and system controls area these this is a lot of text i'm sure but the idea is to segment the network make sure the communication that is happening is on a ip and port basis whatever changes which are going on to the network side or the system configuration side those changes are approved and we have at least a documented uh, documented uh, network diagram with us many organization doesn't have a documented well documented network diagram the moment you ask them they will give you four boxes connected together infer whatever you want to infer out of it right so these are some 10 11 you know pointers uh, so are we circulating these uh, decks yeah because it's too much of a text heavy so i don't want to go, go into that area sure See, if there is a zero day, for example, now what zero day takes advantage of your communication channel, where to enter, how to take data out, right? The moment, for example, you protect your systems with the USB drives, there is no way that the people can come and connect the USB drive to your system and, you know, infect your system. There are programs, uh, you know, NetHunter is one such operating system. You can download, install it on your mobile and then you just need to plug your mobile as a charging device to your laptop and that's done, right? It's pretty simple. Download, there is an instruction, install it on your mobile, Nexus, other wonderful devices and STC and uh, OnePlus, other wonderful devices to be, to host that operating system, easy. All the instructions are there on the YouTube, on the blogs, on the websites, right? The moment you have a channel to come in and a channel to take the data out, <clears throat> it's not the fault of a zero day, right? If we put an IP to IP communication, for example, then I'm trusting the other side of IP, which is probably not under my control. I am trusting this IP to behave in a specific fashion which I can I can agree to. Now usually we put in a pattern that if something is coming from the other side which is our trusted IP we close our eyes and we blind, blindly believe that whatever information is coming from the other side is true. We should not. UAC is one such feature which is provided by the Microsoft the access control feature most of the administrators goes and disable it. Why? Because it's a headache for them to you know, enter the password again and again. Right? If you follow these basic security principles, very basic, which is there in the market, in the discussion for over decades now, if you follow these simple practices, the chances of exposure reduces from 100% to 
to one or two percent. Still, there is no guarantee that you will be immune to a cyber attack. That cyber attack can still happen. But then, in a court of law, you have a point to prove. Today, most of the organizations goes to the court and they fail to prove that they have taken an appropriate due diligence to implement the security controls. They have logs available. Nobody looks at logs. In Electra Card case, I'll take an example. They had antivirus on all the systems, updated, wonderfully running. Antivirus was integrated with the SIM as well, right? The antivirus was crying like anything that there is something on the system. Please look at it. Please look at it. I am not able to detect whether it's a malware or not. Please look at it. Over months, eight months, people really could not understand what is written in a log. Ignore. Eight months, the breach happened. Forty-five million dollar he's for the consumer, twenty-five crore for the organizations to pay as a penalty. Right. Zero days can happen. <clears throat> it may happen that the software that you are downloading, which is authorized, can have that embedded code in itself. Right? That attack can still happen. There can be time bombs in the environment. A piece of a code which is written and which is waiting for some, in you know, some event to happen so that it goes and bursts out. That can happen. But then. You are minimizing your likelihood of that breach. The moment you reduce your likelihood of a breach, you can truly believe that you are on a good scale of a security measure. That is where continuously test the implemented controls and monitor your environment comes in very, very handy. Yes. True. You have to delay the attack, and that's where you know it's a very common phenomena, very common principle: defense of defense in depth in the security. You put layer after layer after layer so that you can delay the attack to reach to your crown jewel. So some of the uh, you know controls from a network and system perspective, some of the controls from a change. Management perspective. Now, how many of us? I I know personally that there is, uh, there, is there, there are organizations wherein they develop application, they run it through the security checks, and then they launch into the market. Right? There are set of organizations who develop the code. They believe that the code is secure, and they launch it in the market. There are organizations who develop the code. Run it through a security test, do a alpha launch, and then do a beta launch, and then come to the market, full fledged, right? Why there's a different opinion or different approach in the structure that they have built? Sometimes organizations feel that this product will give me a competitive advantage. Let me push this product fast. Otherwise, I'll lose the business. Sometimes the organizations are. Very risk averse. They will say, "No, I have to be hundred and two hundred percent sure before I launch this product into the market." So let me do all my due diligence. I don't want anybody to come back to me with a security loophole. Let me first do my work and then I'll push it to the market. Some organizations feel, "I have taken some steps in ensuring that the security of the code or of the product is appropriate, so I'm okay to live with it." Let me launch it, soft launch it, and then see how it behaves. Right? That's the total difference in the approach. Samsung released Note 7. We all know what happened to it. Though it was not a security flaw, but yes, if you relate it back to the human security or the human life, it was a security flaw. Right? So there are different organizations with a different thought process. <clears throat> Malware management. In the organizations that you work with, how many of you think that PCI DSS is one security standard which is applicable to your organization? With the card data, right? Now, PCI has a very clear mandate 
that uh, you know critical patches needs to be installed within 30 days of its release release by the vendor there is a <coughs> report by verizon and it names pcir pci report yearly or two yearly report it comes out it says more than 80 percent of the organizations fail to implement the guidelines or the controls written in the pci year after year so in pci what happened there are two types of assessments that happen uh, assessment one happens in which you do the assessment and you come out with the initial report on compliance then you go back check whether they have fixed all the gaps and then you do a reassessment now it is not about a certificate it is not about getting a pci certificate into the hand and claiming that i am a pci certified organization no it is about maintaining that certification which is a difficult part and if you really follow these steps it's pretty easy I make sure that my systems at home are patched on time. I usually connect my system to the internet at night and I do an auto install when the morning, when I you know wake up, everything is done and dusted for me. Obviously, because I'm not running any business in the night on those systems. But then can we have a parallel systems running for it? Yes. We have DR for it. Right? If we do a patching on DC and DR supports my business in the night, and you know it can switch over as well that can actually do a dr test for me as well i can produce those reports to the auditors to say that i have done a dr testing every day i do a dr testing right <clears throat> so malware management i believe is one area which is very weak in the organizations in terms of specifically in the area of a patch management Hmm. So the difference is the way operating systems are architected. So in Linux, everything is a file. It's a normal clear text file in Linux. In Windows, they work on the extensions. EXE means executable, TXT means text file, DOC means doc. So they, and they associate applications to the extensions in Windows. In Linux, you can open .doc on a command line. You can open .exe on a command line or with the interpreter. So, so that's the architectural difference. Now, what happens? The moment malware comes and sits inside your operating system, it tries to be either an executable or a doc or an XLS or something so that the user clicks on it and then it gets infected, basically executed. In Linux, until or unless you give a execute right to a particular file and somebody executes it, it will not execute. Right? That's one difference. Second, nowadays uh, the Linux or Unix based operating systems, they are coming up with a SC or security enabled architecture. What does that mean is uh, the moment you install anything, you can compartmentalize the execution of that particular process into a memory space and on a hard disk as well. So you can say this process should not take more than this much of a memory, uh, this much of a hard disk space in this particular directory only. Right? So the infection is contained by that way. But the administrators does not understand they disable this feature. <coughs> so that is where the SE Linux or you know so called security enabled feature is there but most of the administrators disable it like the UAC features of Microsoft and that's where they fall prey to the stuff. No, we still need antivirus for Linux and there are use cases for it. For example, you have a mail server on a Linux wherein all the attachments sit and resides, right? Though it may not affect or infect your operating system directly, Linux, but the users who are connecting to the mail server for downloading that attachment, they may get infected by those attachments. So that's where you need a antivirus on the Linux server to scan all the files and alarm you 
that you know there is some suspicious stuff which is there. Correct, it will not affect the email server as such. So, CLAM AV is one such antivirus which is open source available. AVG is there, open source. McAfee is there. So, there are some antiviruses which are available and you can. Yeah. Linux is not safe. But if you compare it, 61,000 versus 61 million. So, I will tell you a classic example of a Linux. <coughs> when you do a Linux to Linux file copy, you can do it with the SCP command, right? Or even with the SSH, you can download and upload the stuff. Now, the moment you do it uh, with a normal command, the the source, yeah, the source system will ask you for the or the destination depends on where you are running the command. It asks you for a password of the other system. So, you enter the password and you get the stuff downloaded. Now, consider a situation where you need to download and upload on a daily basis about 10,000 files. You don't want to enter the password again and again and again, right? So, you do, you fall back to R login, right? I don't want to enter any password. Just give me a free way to download and upload the stuff. I'll do it. I promise I'll do it only once and then I'll remove it. I did it. Went for a coffee. Oh, it's a very hot day. Let me go back home. And that's done. Tomorrow you have forgotten about the R login stuff. It's still running. And you will believe tomorrow you will remove it. Tomorrow never comes. Right? So, you know, it's basically the practice that we follow. And whether we are following it in the right way or not. Data management, keep the data storage to minimum, all those GAN again. But then the, the, you know, the focus point here is point number three, use the hashing, truncation, tokenization and a cryptographic algorithm for your crown jewel data, right? The data which is very near and dear to you. For example, uh, marriage certificates, you can leave it open. Bank accounts, keep it secure. Right? So, make sure that you identify what you want to protect and from whom, and then take a step back, implement different approaches to protect that information. Authentication controls, you know, multi factor authentication, remote administration should be avoided as much as possible, whatever data that we have, whatever systems that we have, implement robust authentication and user identification controls in there, so that you know who is accessing what, and the access is given on a need to know basis, right. Again, uh, we'll get these slides circulated so that you read through it. Monitor the environment, again, same stuff monitor your environment with the logs, integrate everything together, read through the logs, but more importantly, don't hand over these logs to individuals with 2, 3, 4 years experience. Give it to somebody who is having 10, 12, 14 years experience, coming from a business background, coming from an administration background, coming from a probably a security background to understand the meaning of that log. It is only one log which can make or break the environment. Because the moment you identify there is a breach, the time to react to the situation also matters. If you have identified a breach, exactly what has happened in the target, 
people identified the breach but it took 7 days 8 days to come to an action by that time the damage was already done right so identify those logs identify those areas of concern in the logs and then take immediate steps to heal that situation continuously test the implemented controls do a wireless uh, detection rogue wireless detections what is rogue wireless detection anybody yeah yeah absolutely no that's yes hotspots right i have to take my data out uh my proxy doesn't allow me to connect to one drive right and i believe that the moment i do this transaction i'll get a pop up saying or a message saying that you know this is not allowed as per the corporate policy and the legal action or some action will be taken against you i'm threatened by it i don't want to get into that let me just buy a geo 4g 999 it'll work for me right bring into the environment just don't need anything other than the sim card plug it on and connect your laptop to the wireless i'm not giving you the tips to hack okay so connect your system wirelessly on to that geo wifi and then send the data out that is only possible when your browsers are not forced to route the traffic to the proxy right and when the administrators have not given you the permission to modify the configurations of your browser if that's there then you are lucky person so monitor the environment and continuously test for the rogue connections within the environment uh continuously put your it systems your people your processes to the test by doing red teaming exercises by doing physical security breaches or the uh, you know penetration test uh, logical or the application level network level penetration testing vulnerability assessment and stuff like that the moment you do it you would know the areas of cause of concern to you and then you can fix those areas so in, that's important and if you do this we will surely make tomorrow that's all